Hi there, this video is a little unexpected. Originally it was supposed to be the second part of the transistor tester video about changing the firmware, but to do that you need to program the chip. I tried to include that in the video, it just became too long, and besides, maybe you already have your own way to program chips like an RTmega 328P. Because there are so many programmers out there, everybody got their favorite. Also, not all are equally suitable for every job. I went through a few over the years. My preferred programmer at the moment is the TL8662 Plus, which is what I'm showing in this video. That is not to say you have to use the same. I think the easiest programmer is always the one you're familiar with, even it may not always be the easiest one for the job at hand. A key difference is whether a programmer is targeting mainly chips that are sold at in, that means they have to be programmed in circuit, like for example the USB ASP here. They are meant to be connected directly to the PCB with a chip in it. But if the chip is actually socketed, like my transistor tester, these programmers are not so convenient. Using for example USB ASP to program the RTmega 328P outside its circuit is only possible if you make your own breadboard and insert the chip into it. In fact you basically convert it to in-circuit programming where you can remove a chip. In the case of the ATmega 328P as needed for the transistor tester it's quite a hassle as this circuit diagram I borrowed from Electronic Labs shows. It even has to have its own crystal oscillator, which may be a surprise. Many chips, including this one, need a clock while programmed. The chip has a built-in, fairly slow RC oscillator and when you buy a brand new chip, it is set to use that by default. To program this brand new chip, you don't need a crystal clock circuit because the chip ignores it and uses its internal circuit instead. So it will take the new program just fine. but. For use in the transistor tester, part of that new program is to switch the chip to rely on a faster and more accurate external crystal oscillator instead of the built-in one. So without a similar external crystal oscillator in the programming circuit, you will not be able to reprogram this chip ever again. For outer circuit programming, the TL8662 Plus by XGECO with a dual inline SIF socket is hard to beat. For chips that are not in dual inline packages, it comes with a lot of additional adapters for different chip packages that you just need to insert into the SIF socket. An external port and a provided cable also allows using it as an in-circuit programmer, so really it has all the bases covered. The software is impressive and has a massive library of thousands of chips, but it runs only on Windows. As a Linux person, this would be a showstopper for me. Luckily, a nice guy called David Griffith has made a program called MiniPro for the TL8666 type of programmers that runs under Linux and works just fine. I leave a link to his GitHub page in the description. I believe there's also a Windows version of the MiniPro, but then you might as well consider using the original XGECO software. In this video I will be mostly going over installing and using the Linux MiniPro, but not to worry, also show the installation and use of the XGECO Windows version, so the choice of what to use is really yours. It would be a good idea even for Windows user to set up a virtual machine running Linux anyway, because you need that for compiling the transistor tester. Using VirtualBox creating a Linux VM is free and easy. This here is a freshly installed version of Linux Mint, but other Linux flavors are of course available. The first thing is to install some development tools to be able to compile and run MiniPro. I speed that up a bit to save time. After that, I get the latest version of MiniPro from David's GitHub page. And compile it. And then install it. For MiniPro to be allowed to use the USB ports, some new rules have to be copied for the Linux device manager. And instead of rebooting to activate them, I use the trigger command of the device manager. The last operation is to assign myself to the plug dev group of people allowed to use the ports. If only I typed it correctly. Anyway, that way I can use the mini pro to access the USB ports without having to be super user. To activate this new membership, you have to log out and log in. After the re-login, I connect the programmer's USB cable to the computer, but since this is a virtual machine, I have to tell VirtualBox to pretend it's connected to the virtual USB port of my virtual machine instead. Next, let's see if MiniPro works. 
Typing minipo at the command prompt brings up the extensive list of commands. So far, so good. With the dash dash version parameter, it shows that it found a TL8662 plus, but also that the firmware in the programmer is out of date. More about that in a moment. There is a hardware check command that tests the programmer's hardware. It tests lots of stuff and reports that everything is working fine. To get the new firmware, you need to download the latest Windows XE from the XGQ website, which may be a little confusing at first. Even more confusing is that the download is an archive with an extension of .rar. This format is natively supported in Linux, but in Windows you may need to use a utility like WinRAR or UnRAR. I think the popular 7-zip utility can also handle RAR files. Under Linux, the Archive Manager reveals that there is a xgq v 1190 setup exe inside the RAR file, which itself is really just another container, and another call of Archive Manager allows access to the files embedded within. One of the files is called upgrade2.dat, which is the new firmware. Just extract it, we don't need the rest of the exe for Minipro. Of course, if you use the software under Windows, it will also update the firmware. You just don't need Minipro for that. By the way, this is one of the reasons why I love to use the open source Minipro under Linux. While I need to download the Windows version from XGQ, I don't have to trust XGQ and install an executable from them. No offense. I feel safer to just extract the new firmware for the programmer and let Minipro manage the firmware and do the programming. But for your Windows users, I will later run the Windows installer on a Windows machine to show how the real software looks and behaves. In the Linux world, you use Minipro with a minus F parameter and point it at the firmware in the extracted update 2.dat. It is preferable to do this not from a virtual machine because the first thing that happens is that Minipro tells the programmer to switch to the bootloader and that temporarily disconnects it from USB. It reconnects immediately, but that quick disconnect is enough for the virtual box to forget about the assignment of the real USB to the virtual USB of this machine, hence the error. Luckily, you can recover by reconnecting the virtual USB in virtual box. I forgot to capture this, but you can see the command still on the screen. The mini pro was never physically disconnected, so it has not lost power and is still in bootloader mode. So reissuing the firmware update command happily proceeds until the reset command where the USB connection is again briefly lost and VirtualBox again helpfully disconnects the programmer from the virtual machine. And Minipro is certainly not very happy about that. But after another reconnect and trying out a few commands it turns out all is well and the new firmware version 04.2.128 is reported. You can avoid all this scary stuff by running the firmware updates not from the virtual machine. Minipro, with the help of the TL8662 Plus, knows how to program more than 10,000 devices, but you need to know how your device is called. Instead of listing them all, you can use search. That is still way too many. Narrowing it further down, and there we have five different choices. The difference is in the packaging. For the transistor tester, the first one is the one we needed, Artimega 328P in a 28-pin dual inline package. To program a chip, you need to know a little about it. I'm using an Artimega 328P for example, which has 32K of flash memory and 1K of EEPROM to be programmed, but the tricky bit of many microcontrollers is the programming of the configuration registers in form of so-called fuses. The Artimega 328P has four fuse bytes and on this diagram you see the first two. A chip programmer must not only be able to load the flash and EEPROM areas but also set the fuses as well. Fuse bytes are kind of special memory cells and in the early days each bit was really a tiny fuse that is a very weak bonding wire in a diode deep inside the chip. The default with the wire intact was usually treated as the bit having the value of 1. If you wanted to set it to zero, you did this with a strong programming pulse which destroyed the tiny fuse wire and the bit was now zero, permanently, because once the fuse wire was blown there was of course no way back. 
This is where the expression to burn a prom or EPROM came from. Because of this history of real fuse wires, not touching a fuse means programming a one and setting a fuse means programming a zero. Kind of reverse logic going on here. Luckily these days the fuse bits are electronic and can be programmed as often as you wish, but some of them are still special in that you can set them once, but to reset them the whole chip has to be erased. A quick look at the fuse low and high bytes of the Artemega 328P. They are pretty important to get right because they tell the chip what the hardware outside looks like and if you get it wrong, usually it doesn't work at all or very slowly. For example, there are many ways to clock the microcontroller including using an internal very slow RC oscillator. As I mentioned before, on a freshly bought chip using that clock is the default setting of the fuse's low byte. To make use of the 8 MHz crystal in the transistor tester for example, you must set this register to hex F7 which selects an external crystal oscillator of 8 to 16 MHz. Fuse's high is of similar importance and should be set to hex D9 selecting boot vector and that pin PC6 is used to reset the chip. The boot size is not important in this application because there is no bootloader in the Arduino sense and D9 or DF will work. The extended fuse byte should be set to hex FC which selects the brownout detection level. If the supply voltage falls below the brownout detection limit, the controller resets the chip and keeps it reset until the supply voltage returns to the correct value. The lock byte is one of those special fuse registers that can only be reset by erasing the whole chip. Depending on how the lock byte is set, you can prevent people from reading and dumping out the flash and EEPROM content. This is exactly what happened when you try to read the chip that came with the transistor tester, at least that was the case for me. Using the proper chip name, I used the minus "-r", command to tell MiniPro to read the contents of the flash called code, EEPROM called data and the fuses. There are no error messages of any kind and three files have been created as you would expect. But opening the EEPROM file shows just a lot of hex FFs. The same is true for the content of the flash memory, just more of hex FF. The reason is apparent when we look at the fuses. The lock byte is set to hex FC. That means whoever was programming the chip does not want you to be able to make a copy of its content. You can, of course, program it with new content, but since that will erase the current content, you can't, for example, save it as a backup in case something goes wrong with the new firmware and you need to revert back. There's no undo, so to say. That kind of sucks, especially for boards where the chip needs to be programmed in circuit. For chips that are programmed outside, you have at least the option of buying a second chip for trying out the new firmware and leaving the old one intact as a backup. But now let's say we have some new firmware, the TL8662 Plus and MiniPro can deal with binary or various other firmware file formats. Here I'm using Intel hex format. So we have two files, both in hex format, one for the flash content with the extension of .hex and one that has the extension .eep file for the eeprom, but it's in fact also in hex format. Of course, we also need a fuse file. For that, I conveniently copy the one that was created when trying to read the chip. It has the right format and since this came from a working version, most bits are actually correct. To allow future backups, I decided to change the lock byte, allowing the content to be read out. To burn the software into a chip, the first thing is to do erase it. The sequence in which to burn the rest does not matter. Here I'm doing the EEPROM or data section first, followed by the actual code which at 32K takes of course much longer than the 1K EEPROM. Last not least, it's necessary to burn the new fuse values. And that is all. The chip can now be taken out of the programmer and inserted back into the circuit. Let's see how to do the same thing in Windows. As I mentioned already, the download file is actually an archive in RAW format. I already extracted the EXE that Windows needs. This, by the way, is my old Windows 7 test laptop that, as long-time viewers know, has already seen many strange software installs. Unfortunately, I don't have anything with a more up-to-date Windows version.
The installer does the usual thing extracting stuff from the EXE and putting it into the installation folder. It then prompts for the administrator password which isn't captured. Obviously because it needs to install its own device driver. Would I like to install this device software? Well, I guess I have no choice. But I always trust this manufacturer for future updates, so no way. I speed this up a little. Success! The drivers were installed. The program icon appears on the main desktop and so starting wasn't captured, but I did not have the programmer plugged in, so it came up with this prompt. I plugged my TL8662 Plus in and ticked the box. And there it is. I have to say it really looks very comprehensive and well put together. Let's do a quick self-test. And everything's fine. I have to say I'm quite impressed by the program. It can do lots and it will certainly keep the Windows version to exploit a bit more, but now to the task of programming the ATmaker 328P. I did play around with it a little, so it's already set for that chip, but let's pretend it wasn't. Like with Minipro, you do a search and start typing the chip name. And unsurprisingly, it comes up with the same choices. For this job, we need to select 328P in the DIP28 package. Next, I tried erasing the chip and since the DIP package, it shows how to insert it into the SIP40 socket. It turns out that explicitly erasing is actually unnecessary since the programming does that automatically. To program anything but FFs, we need to load the flash buffer with data using the load file menu. I selected a flash file in hex format and now it shows the content. I'm doing the same for the EEPROM buffer. Now for the config, which are of course the fuses. I started setting the fuse bits and I'm showing this in accelerated form, not only because it's so slow, but also it's all wrong. Embarrassingly, I totally forgot about the reverse logic of what setting a fuse means, even though XKey Pro thoughtfully wrote it right next to it. A tick means setting a zero, not a one, but who reads menus, right? Now to program it, which works of course, as opposed to the chip, which of course did not work at all because of its messed up fuses. After I discovered my mistake, I put the chip back into the programmer and set about fixing the fuses, which is kind of reversing every bit, that is, where I previously ticked I need to untick and vice versa. I also noticed that the fuse values in hex are shown on the bottom right, which serves as a nice control to check that this time I got it right. Well, onwards to do the programming. And this time it worked just fine, of course. Well, and that's it. Now that I covered how to program an RTMaker 328P, the next video will be about making these hex files with the new firmware for the transistor tester. So don't forget to subscribe if you have not already and maybe consider becoming a Patreon, link in the description. As Patreon you get early access to videos, a blog and other exclusive content. Thanks for watching.